Skid Row in Los Angeles has been described as an almost unbelievable landscape of hope and despair. It represents the largest outdoor houseless community in the country. In the 2007 documentary Skid Row, hip hop artist Pros Michaels from the Fugees claimed that the area had the highest concentration of parolees, the highest concentration of service providers, the highest infant mortality rate, and the highest suicide rate in the city. I personally cannot impress on you enough about the size and scale of this place. In 2014, LA Weekly wrote, as shocking as it is to look upon the rows and rows of makeshift encampments and thousands of roving hopeless people Perhaps even more shocking is this. Los Angeles is the last major American city with a single district of anything approaching this magnitude of homelessness and extreme poverty. Now, since then, the situation has only gotten worse. And just a few blocks away in downtown Los Angeles, for the last several years, waves and waves of capital, mega projects and new residents had been pouring into what is now called DTLA, downtown LA. Uh, and if anyone who's followed this podcast or this issue or seen our film priced out, you know that new investment coming into an area sometimes seem like a really good thing. But over the long haul, very rare that local residents see any benefit from that new investment. So what does this mean? to Skid Row, a community that provides vital services, but is also overwhelmed by the social problems it faces. And I'm very, very proud and happy to have John Malpede here uh, to talk about this issue. He's a highly acclaimed artist and artistic and theatrical director. He's been working with poverty impacted communities for over three decades. He's received countless awards and fellowships for his work, including New York Dance Theater's Workshops Bessie Creation Award, San Francisco Art Institute's Adeline Kent Award, LA Theater Alliance Ovation Award. He taught at my old school, Tisch, at NYU. And in 1985, he founded the Los Angeles Poverty Department the first performing artist group in the nation that worked primarily with homeless and formerly homeless people. He's the director there, and he's also the curator at the Skid Row History Museum and Archive. And they look at issues, uh, a number of issues, including gentrification. John, thanks thanks so much for joining me. Glad to be here. Can you tell us a little bit about, about your work over the years with, with both the museum and with the L.A. Poverty Department? Well, yeah, I mean, the L.A. Poverty Department was, was, uh, was, it grew, it grew out of, I got, I was still living in New York, I got involved with some, uh, some activists who were working in Skid Row, uh, around the time of the Olympics when there were a lot of police sweeps of the streets in order to make things happy for visitors. Uh, I felt that the, the, the community work that was going on, which was a conjunction of, um, Mainly people out of the Catholic Worker and, and clients who, who people who use the Catholic Worker services at the community. Uh, we had a really smart approach for um, fighting for the rights of people who lived and lived there, whether they were housed or unhoused. And I got involved in that. And uh, within a year, I ended up moving out there to do that full time, and then um, started this performance workshop because in New York I was known as a performance artist. And the idea was to uh, make community on Skid Row and get the real deal out to Normalville, which meant tell the story of what was going on from the point of view of the people who, who lived there. And what what does the Skid Row Museum do? You know, the, the displacement narrative is that Skid Row is a no man's land of, of transients, and uh, that there's no community there. So um, many years ago, we, we did a project called Is There History on Skid Row? And uh, from that, we uh, tried to do a public art work project that um, sort of like a Hollywood work, work, a walk of stars, only uh, acknowledging um, people who had lived and worked in the community and that stuff. 
and that predictably ran into huge political uh, antagonism from the business community and from the, the people that worked for them at City Hall, and so that you know didn't happen as a as an inside as an in the sidewalk thing because faces of activists would have shown up at places where they weren't wanted, and uh, so we decided instead we we started to. We put walls around our museum and located it on the forefront of gentrification mm-hmm. to address, really look at both the history of the community and uh, how it's resisted uh, gentrification over the years. I want to talk about that history for sure. I was there. I just want to like get to the maybe the sort of like where where it is right now, um, and then back up into the history. So I don't know, I've only been there once. It was 2003, and it was it was really just like literally shocking to me. Like a literally like I, my body was shocked. It was tensed to come upon this this area in in the documentary Skid Row. They said that within a five block area, there was 40,000 people that had come through that uh, in one year. Uh, you know, I saw what seemed to be hundreds of people just on the streets, lining blocks and blocks of sidewalks. And what is it like today? I think today there are about 3,000 people living on the street in Skid Row and about, you know, um, at least 15,000 people who, are, who live indoors, most and two thirds of those are probably permanent residents. So a lot of those people live there five, ten, twenty years, and other people are in uh, a smaller part are in transitional programs. Uh, you know, which is, and that's where a lot of the transitional programs are. And as you mentioned from uh, the, the 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 Fuji uh, documentary, yeah, most of most uh, most people coming out of um, state prisons. And uh, coming to LA end up in Skid Row, and that's because that's where there are reentry programs. That's where there's uh, you know available hotel and shelter space. So it's it's um, it continues to be a resource, uh, you know, because that's where the services exist. You know, while there are 3,000 people living on the street in Skid Row, there are, you know there are something like 30,000 people or more living on the streets of the city. And most of those people, uh, encampments have spread, uh, they're pretty much everywhere in the city. And most of those people are completely on their own, meaning there's no, uh, there are no, you know, there are no surfaces at all near where those people are. Right, and, and we talked earlier, and you were saying that you know since you know over the last decade the problem has gotten so much worse. There were more people down in Skid Row, but also the homeless encampments uh, and houseless communities all over the city. And you were just talking about an Echo Park, which is a rapidly gentrifying area. That there's a um, there's kind of a camp there that gets bigger. I mean, it's the same situation in Portland. The scale is is not nearly as dramatic, but um, there are, are houseless communities now in almost every sector of the city. What you were saying, the distinction is that at Skid Row, people can get some services that they need, whether that's, um, I'm assuming, like drug recovery, medical services, and and they can get shelter in Skid Row. There are um, SROs, which single room occupancy hotels, uh, and and the shelters. So there there are things for them, and the majority of people on Skid Row do have places to live. They're not on the sidewalk, right? Well, there's still 3,000 people on the sidewalk, and I think, you know, everything is pretty much, you know, quite full. Mm-hmm. But, um, yeah, and, and, the, and one of the issues in Skid Row is that um, there's a desire within Skid Row to build the more affordable housing there, but um, the rest of downtown, uh, the gentrifying part of town, doesn't, says we've done enough, um, meaning downtown, and they don't, they, they resist any... Uh, any further uh, building of facilities or locating of services. There is 
so much money going in to downtown LA. I mean, it, it seems like there's billions of dollars in investment, whether that's between you know sports stadiums, uh, luxury hotels, and museums. I mean, it, the the amount of investment is really unbelievable, especially if you live in little Portland, Oregon. Uh, you know, L- LA like drops more money out of its out of its uh, coat pocket than than Portland ever dreams to have for these types of things. But tell me a little bit more about just how did Skid Row come into existence? There was a time in the country when when every city, every downtown had a Skid Row. I myself in the in the early '90s, before I became a, a gentrifier, before I bought a, a house. Uh, I and I don't sell houses, but I just bought one in, in a poor community. Um, I lived on Skid Row in Seattle, and and Skid Row in Seattle was called itself the original Skid Row because they used to skid logs down Yesler Street to the to the mills at the waterfront. I lived right there at the bottom of the hill, and you know it was a rough a rough area, sort of. It, it wasn't really it's nothing compared to to Skid Row in Los Angeles. Skid Row in Los Angeles persists. So how how did it come about? As you said, the name comes out of Seattle, and basically, you know, wherever there was a opportunity for day laborers, whether it would be unloading boxcars or sliding logs, um, people would congregate, and there'd be uh, short stay hotels that, was, that were built around there, and uh, and sometimes missions and stuff like that. And so that's where that's so it's for itinerant workers uh, that housing, and then um, in most you know in most places. Those uh, those areas were, uh, were were built over, and the population dispersed, or at least uh, I would say colonized under the I mean, more affluent forces. And um, in in Skid Row, uh, you know, if you're familiar with the LA, there's, there's Bunker Hill, which is what you mm-hmm. see in car commercials and stuff like that. All the, the original high rise skyline, which is now expanded uh, geographically, but it was on top of Bunker Hill, which had been. A, uh, like the previously a, a, a low-income residential community with apartments and boarding houses. It was under urban renewal. It was a clear, declared a blighted area, and the entire hilltop, if you were from Kentucky, you would say it was mountaintop removal, you know. Uh-huh. And uh, the trans- it was transferred from residential to corporate, the entire landscape. And on the success, on the quote, quotation mark success of that, there was another uh, business generated plan called the Silver Book Plan. And it was it proposed what to do with the rest of downtown, which included uh, what to do with Skid Row. And basically it was to re, uh, reduce it to one block and, and, uh, and build up scale developments of various kinds uh, on all the rest of it. Um, I also heard that in again in Skid Row the documentary they said that the railroad terminated um, that was kind of the, the last stop for the railroad and so that um, you know hobos and folks who, who who were kind of itinerant workers or, or you know traveling around uh, they would also congregate there so like from its very early days it had sort of a scrappy sort of personality. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I mean, that's, the hotels were there, but yeah, it was because the railroad ended there. Again, the Catholic Worker and Legal Aid Foundation and something called the Community De- Design uh, Center, they came up with an alternative plan, and they um, and they presented it, uh, and, and basically their plan said, let's save this low-income housing, all these hotels that were built for the itinerant r- workers in this 50-block square area because, number one, it's a lot cheaper than building housing, uh, you know, for low income, uh, super low income housing, I mean, extremely low income housing. And number two, um, if you, if you demolish it, uh, the people in this neighborhood are going to go somewhere else, like your neighborhood. So it was a, um, idealistic plan that also, uh, scared the hell out of, uh, mm-hmm. out of, uh, people who didn't, you know, really give a damn about low income people, only that they didn't want them around. Mm-hmm. So, um, so this coalition of the idealistic and the cynical um, <laughs> came up with the, the solution of, of uh, saving the housing in the 50 square block area, which, as I said, didn't happen in any other city, and that's why there are no others. Why, like that LA Weekly article called LA Skid Row, the last Skid Row. All the others have, you know, if you go to New York, the Bowery is full of multiplexes and luxury hotels and uh, fancy this and fancy that. So 
Um, and Skid Row in that, Seattle is all is so, is becoming, you know, kind of like a high end retail area. Uh, as well. I mean, uh, Paul Allen, Vulcan Industries, and all those guys are kind of slowly, you know, putting uh, high rise office buildings uh, in, you know, o- over the over the shoulder of old Skid Row. There's been, you know, obviously because Skid Row is just, it's, it's just east of the, um, you know, the rest of downtown. Um, it's, it's, there's been a continuous, uh, ever since that time, there's been one plan after another to try and figure out how to get a hold of this real estate and, uh, you know, and realize the value in the land and while disregarding the human uh, value that's there now. It, the, there was a containment policy, it's literally called containment. Right, which is you know deliberately concentrating social services in an area um, in Skid Row, the dock. They they said the intention was that people would avail themselves of a centralized area of services and then move on. But you know people don't necessarily have the ability to move on, as, as, and over time they they or stay there. Stay, yeah, or at least stay in that area if everything that they allegedly needed was in that area, then they wouldn't. Um, and I, I love this combination of the compassionate and the cynical, like uh, <laughs> joined forces. So they ended up. They ended up. Um, first, they gave money to um, some of the owners of the hotels, and suddenly, and they realized quickly that that money just disappeared. Um, and so they ended up uh, creating a nonprofit and buying a lot of the hotels. Subsequently, another nonprofit was created by activists in the area that bought up more hotels. So, so now I think they're over 60 hotels and they were able to build some others um over there are over 60 hotels that are in the hands of nonprofits uh that you know provide um housing that's decent and seventies fifties sixties seventies i think it's fair to say it was kind of a classic american downtown in a classic sprawl city like a Houston or Atlanta, uh, where you know the residents had just scattered to the winds, and and so had the businesses had left. There were some corporate holdouts who occupied you know citadels in the sky, uh, fortified against any real interaction with people on the, on the ground, and and it was sort of like a combination of of r- remaining poor communities uh, or working class communities. And abandoned areas and this like sterile, corporatized, privatized space. Um, not a place that the majority of, of the metropolitan area wanted to, to spend time in. And then about 10 years ago, you really started to see a pickup of investment. You know, can you tell me a little bit about how that came about? Uh, actually, one thing that one thing that did that was the um, the adaptive reuse ordinance, which mm-hmm, was, mm-hmm. Uh, came in around 1999, I think, something like that. Which allowed uh, commercial spaces, vacant commercial spaces, to be um, to be transformed into quote loft living, and um, so that you know that brought in uh, that had a lot to do with bringing in a residential neighborhood and the desi- and again the, the desire of creating a, a sort of an entertainment district, with, you know, top heavy with bars and restaurants. Um, friend, uh, after the friend of mine said recently, you know, the the I've actually downtown LA is probably the most mixed income part of the city mm. even though um, when they did the adaptive reuse ordinance none of the none of those buildings were uh, they didn't have any thought of turning some of those vacant buildings downtown into housing for low income or homeless people you know mm. that was not part of their equation at all mm-hmm. um, but by bringing in a, a more affluent group of people suddenly there is a mixed income uh, LA is, a, you know, its own beast, its own entity, and that gentrification is sort of, it's very decentralized, and sort of neighborhoods all across the city are, are gentrifying at simultaneously to downtown. There's no real relationship there between the connections, but um, the adaptive reuse thing, the lot living, is like so common to so many of these gentrification uh, sort of uh, was, developments. Like. 
it was um, the ordinance was first applicable to downtown and then subsequently to other places. And um, there's a there's a similar rezoning effort going on right now. Right. They're, re they're rewriting the zoning code, which was uh, which is something that had just been a bunch of posted notes over the last since the 40s, I guess. So they're quote rationalizing the code, but as a result, they're writing new community plans. And this um, again, one of the first ones they're they're realizing is the one in downtown. So again, it's an, it's another it's a current uh, a current threat to the to the neighborhood. tell me this this seems to be like the big existential threat in that you have this investment rolling through downtown and the next big sort of quote unquote undervalued opportunity zone is essentially the industrial properties that exist in Skid Row you know Skid Row has these housing uh, you know SROs these hotels where people in need live but there's also some industrial sites uh, but there's not a lot of other market rate, rent, you know, rental or home ownership um, sites. So markets, investors are looking at if we can convert these industrial areas, we can make some money. Um, and, and is that is that correct? Fish, fish packing industry is actually the main industry down there. But there's also there's a lot of land banking going on. There are a lot of vacant properties. Mm -hmm. A long time. Only a few market rate loft buildings that are in the area. Nothing, nothing. They haven't been able to build anything there. But that would all change under the um, proposed rezoning. And um, on the east side of Skid Row, what you, down by the LA River, it was for many years known as the Artist District. And now, of course, it's the Artist District in in caps. But all the artists have been removed in very right. high. Um, very high end uh you know uh condos and, and and things have gone into that area so so Skidwell stands between those the those two part, gentrified parts of downtown and the the goal the goal of the new zoning seems to be you know to um to to link those two via um upscaling um skid row uh the the residential population is all low income they um the neighborhood has been able to you know, really activate on its own behalf. That's the only reason it's there, like I said earlier, because of various fights that have kept it from from uh, being disappeared. Like right after the adaptive reuse ordinance happened, just outside of Skid Row on Main Street, uh, there were a lot of uh, residential hotel conversions, and people were displaced. Um, people in Skid Row organized, and they got a citywide hotel moratorium uh, mm. uh, enacted. So, so it's um, so because the neighborhood has had, you know, uh, sort of a residential part of the neighborhood and the people working uh, with the residents have had sort of a, a, a distinct vision of, of what's wanted and needed, uh, they've been able to uh, successfully advocate for that. But if, there, if the entire area is overlaid with, um, with development, it will be that much harder to, um, for that voice to be heard. What is the current state of, of resisting this uh, this rezone? Well, I mean, we actually the neighborhood has successfully fought a number of individual projects, and right now we entered into a dialogue with the planning department that has actually been over the last year because we sort of got ahead of the curve on this, and uh, so uh, so that's resulted in in uh, significant attention from the planning department and uh, understanding of the community wants and some uh, alteration of the plan but you know this, the planning department works for the city council and the mayor so the, ser the serious heavy lifting uh, when the next uh, iteration of the plan comes out and afterwards there's a coalition that, uh, called the Skidrow Now 2040 coalition that's developing uh, that we're a part of that's developing its own um, its own neighborhood plan you know we're planning to continue to push for what we see as a more uh, equitable uh, solution that respects the, the people and the culture that exists.
in Portland, we're beginning to see the city council begin to get reshaped by the housing crisis, meaning that people, voters have been organized or responding to, um, you know, the daily headlines, the protests in the street over housing crisis. And you know, at least one standing city council has been knocked out. And the the current slate of, of people running for the open seat uh, here in November are all, you know, sort of housing first is their, their platform. Um, are you seeing that kind of movement in, in, in L.A. politics as well? I would say no. Mm. It hasn't happened. Do you feel you have any other leverage or that the community there, resistance, if it's a resistance community or, or other um, institutions and allies, or, or do they have a... Do they see other leverage that they can get? I know there was a big bond that was passed a couple of years back that was supposed to help fund um, services for houseless communities. For homeless communities? Yeah. <laughs> so last, in the last year and a half, H, Proposition H and Proposition HHH passed. One was to provide services, uh, so outreach services and services in support of hotels and uh, for supportive housing, and the other was to create supportive housing over 10 years. So that's that's something that's going on now, and there's been a lot of um, there's a lot of, been a lot of resistance resistance to creating the housing because mm-hmm. of Indias and various mm-hmm. you know people who voted for the for the bond measure don't want it to go into their na- the housing to actually go into their neighborhood. So that's an ongoing thing that that, uh, that uh, the people are wrestling with, and there is a, you know there is. A, there are a number of groups that are that are um, you know fighting when various council people don't want to have, support people who don't want to have any housing going there into their neighborhood. You know, so that's an ongoing thing. And the big concern among many of us is you know is the money actually going to be spent? Well, that's about that's about all the time we have. Um, John, is there is there something that you can um, something that you, you something else you want to say, but also like a, a direction you would want listeners to take, things that they you'd want them to get plugged into if they want to help with this issue or learn more. Um, well, I mean, as, you know, like I said, I mentioned the Skid Row Now twenty forty plan regarding the future of Skid Row. Mm-hmm. Um, is one is one thing I, I don't know. Um, well, that, yeah, that's one thing. The ongoing fight about what's going to happen with H and HHH, um, and uh, just uh, earlier in the week, the mayor proposed, um, you know, that each council district set up a uh, a temporary shelter. I guess trying to get around the fight over who doesn't who doesn't want it in their neighborhood. Um, but I'm not sure that that was that wasn't anywhere near adequate. I can tell you about it. Mm. So basically, there's a you know there's a homeless crisis. The, 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 you know the government still ha- the local government still hasn't come up with an adequate response. Well, we will include uh, links to those to those um, to your organizations and definitely to to those campaigns. And um, yeah, I mean. It's it's a it's a tough situation. LA is is so expensive all over the place. We hope to cover um, more of the neighborhoods. Boyle Heights is is right adjacent to Los An- uh, to downtown LA, and that's a, that's a big flashpoint. Um, but I wish you the best of luck. You know, in in Portland, it was it got to the point where just there was no affordable places left, and only at that point did the, the did residents sort of push back and begin to change things at city council i hope it doesn't come to that in la but um just wish you the best of luck sir and thank you so much for for talking with us okay thanks so much Cornelius.